AA Beyond Belief is a podcast by, for, and about people who have found a secular path to sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. Hello and welcome to another weekly Friday sober distancing episode of AA Beyond Belief. I'm John and I am here with my co-host Angela. How you doing, Angela? I'm good. Thanks for asking. It's nice to see you. Nice to hear (laughs) you. And we have a special guest today. Uh, His name is Bob Kay. He is from Whitby, Ontario, which is located in the nation state of Canada, which is someplace up north of here. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, he is the co-founder of the Whitby Free Thinkers Group, and he is the author of um, Free Key Players um, in AA yes, Key History. Key Players in the AA History. And uh, anyway, he's a good friend, and I'm glad to have him here. We thought that he could, uh, we could talk a little bit about AA History and take your questions. Uh, you can call in. I'll type the number in in the chat room, but that number is eight. 8- Four four eight nine nine eight two seven eight. So, Bob, how are you? I'm uh, as well as can be expected under these very strange conditions. Uh, I'm staying safe and uh, behaving fairly smartly, but uh, I'm not a good uh, I'm not a good isolator. So I get out in the car and go for drives and stuff, and uh, I get around a bit. AA history. This period of time that we're in right now will be AA history that we're going through now. And uh, AA will come out a little bit different, probably, I think, as a result of it. So I think that's inevitable. Uh, You know, the Zoom stuff, it's fabulous that we have it. Otherwise, we'd just be phoning each other or not phoning each other. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a pretty good substitution. And I think there'll be a lot of Zoom in the normal world after because of the convenience of midnight and whatever. And, uh, you know, I can do AA whenever I want and I don't have to leave the house even. Yeah. And we have a a lot of, well, not a lot, but we have people joining our meeting, our our zoom meeting in Boise uh, from the East coast and from the South and, and all over the place, Cleveland and, and stuff. And so we're keeping one of our meetings going, um, in Zoom after, um, you know, we're able to meet face to face again, um, because we've made friends and we have, you know, people that, that enjoy our meeting now. Yeah, we actually have, are probably going to do something like that too. We have, uh, somebody from our, um, one of our meetings, he wants to have, um, a, hi- a hybrid where we have the Zoom and the live meeting at the same time. He wants to do that after this whole epidemic thing is done. I said, well, if that's what the if that's what you guys want to do, then you can vote on that. That's fine. But so, Bob, let's talk about AA history and and maybe um, what would be nice is if uh, uh, we let you talk about a few topics that you're interested in that you've uh, been thinking about, and then we can. Uh, I know Angela has some questions for you that she um, has uh, had some friends ask pick, about. Oh, pick me, pick me. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've got uh, about 21 people right now in the chat room who um, can ask questions through the YouTube chat, and you can also call in at our uh, toll free number. So, Bob, you've got the floor. Okay, so I've been saying for a long time that. Uh, For secularists especially, uh, AA history is good for us because in so many cases it destroys the myths that are being propagated by fundamentalists and big book thumpers. And, uh, you know, I love the uh, recent uh, Bill Shaberg book called Writing the Big Book. It's so fabulous. He's, he, He did stuff that I didn't do, go to archives and read letters and Lois's diary. And he focused 10 years of research on a really primarily on the 18 month period the big book was produced. So uh, there is a lot of mythology about that and it kind of gets blown up. Uh, I knew about some before. Here's, Here's a real, here's a classic example. Bill's story, uh, Ebby is in the hospital and supposedly 
takes them through some Oxford group, uh, Christian mumbo jumbo. Uh, somehow that ends up being written uh, as the 12 steps for some people see 12 steps in there existing four years before Bill Wilson sat down and wrote them. But uh, so I found out about 10 years ago, Bill's story, as we see it in the book, is the third draft of that story. And, and I was directed to a website, which is actually a, a bunch of uh, crazed fundies in Indianapolis. But the guy that runs it is a real history guy. It's the most brilliant pictures. And uh, so he had copies of the first two uh, drafts of Bill's story. And the spiritual experience takes place in his house after Ebby uh, leaves. So Ebby comes uh, at the end of November, gives Bill the religious pitch. Bill's drunk. Uh, Ebby leaves. So he starts thinking about his grandfather's spiritual experience and it lets his imagination run wild and think something happened in the kitchen. Well, there's a couple of problems with that story. Uh, it's not the result of these steps that produced it because he hadn't done those at all. Uh, and the second thing, it didn't make him stop drinking because he drank two more weeks. <laughs> so, you know, that's just a, a, you know, that's a classic. And, you know, like the fundies will get in your face if you don't do this, that, 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 and the other thing. And uh, a lot of this stuff just doesn't hold up. I mean, uh, you know what I'm like, I could blast you 90 minutes on, all that stuff, but that's, that's a classic. Yeah. The, and I, 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 I read a little bit about that too, that um, just the whole setup of that conversation in the kitchen didn't go down exactly the way that it's, it's written in the big book that Ebby and Bill both had different versions of it, of what actually, how it actually was, went down. Well, yeah. And use your imagination. Who would you believe the sober guy <laughs> or the guy that was drunk, you know, and the guy that was drunk, uh, like uh, Sheberg comes out in the first chapter, hard hitting with Bill, the myth maker, the uh, history of being a storyteller. Uh, in some of the other biographies, uh, you know, uh, uh, Matthew Raphael, uh, a book you were interested in. Uh, yeah, so I read that years ago and I, I quoted a few times. This is, uh, you know, Bill, Bill was a masterful storyteller, just like his father. So his father was this popular bar drinker guy that he could sing, he could tell stories, a handsome guy, attractive to women, not his wife. Uh, so there's where some of that comes from. If your father's a player, the psychologists tell us your your admired father is going to get imitated. So, so it's like not you know um, I haven't read Schauberg's book. I've I've had it there ever since it came out, and just haven't gotten to read it. I mean, it's a gigantic book. And it's amazing that that huge giant book is about just a small period of time in AA history. So there's got to be a lot of information in there. But from what I read about from some comments that people have made, it's like uh, people thinking that that Bill was a liar, basically. But that wasn't necessarily the, the, the case. It's more that he was a storyteller, that maybe his it, what he was saying he believed to be true. You think that's that's what was going on with him? So, uh, Sheberg is taking a lot of heat and, uh, uh, I've had some interaction with him, uh, in the course of, uh, you know, I kind of got a book review ready, uh, read about that we released at the time, uh, the book came out. So I had a PDF of the book in advance. And, uh, to be honest, I didn't read the whole mammoth thing. I read most of it. I read the chapters that were really interesting. I skimmed some of the others and, um, but, he is not anti-Bill. This isn't an Orange Papers book. Uh, Joe C. interviewed him, and he said, a lot of people are hearing about your book, and they're objecting to you raking Bill over the coals. Uh, so some of it was like Bill knew he was fabricating. He was doing a sales job. So, uh, yeah, so Shaberg, uh, you know, he said, go read all the letters, go through the archives for 10 years. And if you come to a different conclusion, come back and tell us about it. D'Angelo, did you, you mentioned that you were talking to some people who had some questions that you wanted to throw Yeah, up. yeah. Um, so the first question, um, and um, several people asked it, 
was regarding the Lord's Prayer. When did that start? Um, was it something that they were doing from the beginning, or is it something that uh, some people came up with? We, we mentioned a little bit last week, I think, about the Sinan cult um, that was in, like, what was it, the 90s or the 80s um, in California? Did they start it, or what's the deal with the Lord's Prayer, basically? Okay, uh, so... Uh, the earliest meetings, before there were really AA meetings, uh, um, you know, in Akron, they went to these, these rich people, uh, kind of took in this Oxford group, which was a first century religious Christian group, it was a Christian group. So they had a lot of praying at their meetings, and AA uh, didn't really exist independently till around the time of the book. And... Uh, you know, they, uh, and well, New York parted from the Oxford group in 1937. But uh, when the book was written, the Ohio people were still going. So it was a Christian book, uh, a Christian group, and uh, they had lots of prayers. And what's the granddaddy of Christian prayers is the Lord's Prayer. So they said the Lord's Prayer in the Oxford group. When they started AA, uh, they kept a lot of the practices, and that was one of them. And uh, you know, uh, boy, AA members are on that one. They're just so reluctant to change that. Uh, to me, it's just so obviously wrong. And not that it's a prayer, that it's, we have affiliation alliance with Christians with that. You know, how many tens of thousands of new people have come in, you know, maybe listen to an interesting speaker and then saw Lord's Prayer at the end, nodded their head, okay, religious cult, I'm out of here. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about was, um, and I guess I, I'm most of my stuff was concentrating on um, Bill because uh, a lot of the people that are, are listening are newer to uh, secular AA, and some of them still, you know, have to go to traditional meetings because they don't, you know, have any um, secular meetings in their area. Um, and so when, you know, they want to express themselves, um, you know, most people don't care or they don't want to know about Jim Birdwell or, you know, any of that stuff or, or Ebby or that. But if you say Bill did this or whatever, then, you know, um, they want to hear about that because they might be able to, to talk to somebody in their meeting about it. Um, so I thought maybe talking about, um, about Bill's depression, um, you know, um, many people who come into the into AA um, have other things. Um, both John and I have talked about our um, our issues with depression as as well as um, being in recovery. Um, so that I thought would be a good a good topic. Um, also, that transitions into um, his experiments with. LDS, LDS, sorry, that's the a prominent religion around here. <laughs> I don't think he was a Latter-day Saint. Um, so, I mean, his LSD experiments. Um, and then that's also an interesting subject because, you know, right now um, psychedelics are making a comeback as a um, remedy to alcoholism and depression and to, you know, help people with, with fear who are at, get in, in stage um, cancer and stuff like that so i thought those would be be two things that uh that would be interesting to people and then always um people you know want to hear a little bit about his womanizing and stuff and that's that's particularly interesting right now because a lot of us are realizing during this pandemic um how many other things that we have that we transfer addictive tendencies to like food or um, or Netflix or whatever, we, we tend to go overboard on a lot of things. And so that's becoming a little more prevalent to some of us now that we, you know, are out of our normal routine. And so just hearing about those things as they apply to AA history w was interesting to me. Yeah, so, and they're interesting things. And uh, uh, in the first place, uh, Bill Wilson is a fascinating character and Dr. Bob Smith, the Ohio guy, isn't. <laughs> right. It starts with as simple as that. And uh, Dr. Bob Smith, he didn't, 
uh, won any attention. Bill Wilson was more like me, liked the spotlight, uh, and uh, likes attention, likes to be answering questions, and uh, and likes to talk about his passion, Alcoholics Anonymous. But uh, the story of AA and the story of Bill Wilson, they're just intertwined. It's just uh, it's hard to talk about one without getting into the other. And uh, so, Bill, as far as depression. First of all, uh, his mother was a brilliant woman, uh, started as a school teacher, got married at about 25, uh, got divorced at about 35, and uh, came home and announced uh, one day after the divorce was final, uh, well, two kids, um, uh, Bill was about nine, his younger sister said, I'm flunking you with grandpa and grandma, her parents. And uh, I'm going to Boston to study to become a physician, which he did and uh, became a specialist. Clearly a smart woman, but uh, she was neurotic. Uh, she had what they called at the time nervous breakdowns. Uh, she would go to bed for periods, uh, long periods at a time. We understand that as depression today, they would have labeled it differently. And she was a hypochondriac. And Bill Wilson was every one of those things, uh, you know, he, he learned them or got some bad genetics from uh, the mother's uh, DNA cocktail. So he, uh, um, you know, we can oversell the 12 steps and especially in fundamentalist meetings and they fix everything. And, you know, uh, some people want people uh to not go to doctors and they want them to get off antidepressants and, you know, they want God to fix everything and just pray. It'll all be good and do this uh, exactly as it was written in the book. And uh, you will be yeah. fine. And, you know, why wasn't Bill Wilson fine? He wasn't close to being fine. He had periods of depression on and off, long ones, serious ones. Uh, it was a tremendous uh, battle. Uh the LSD, LDS. I have, two <laughs> I have that two psychology degrees from a fine university, and you do not need those to know that that was a Freudian slip of some kind. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, so uh, AA got going, and it got uh, some publicity, and it started to spread, and uh, you know, it became known across America. They call it a national institution. Uh, kind of after the Saturday Evening Post article, and it grew and had a real boom period, and it's helped a lot of people. Uh, you know, AA helped me before I even picked up my first drink, because my father got sober when I was 11 years old. So, you know, I am no AA hater, but I'm seen that way because I like to be realistic about some of the stuff we need to be realistic about. So, AA, in spite of God running the show, doesn't fix certain populations of people. They're segments of the mentally ill. You know, uh, they, they thought they were psychotic in the 40s. And, uh, you know, a proper, uh, Silkworth called them psychopaths, and uh, probably sociopaths would be the most accurate description. And with any uh, area of mental illness that's serious ones, especially, like schizophrenia. So there were some doctors in uh, Saskatchewan. We got a Canadian connection. That's a long way from where I am. I'm closer to John than I am to Saskatchewan. I'm just east of Toronto. But um, so these doctors were finding there was a high incidence of uh, alcoholism among the schizophrenics, and they started having AA meetings at the clinic, and a few of these people got better. But uh, the relapse rate was high and the percentage was was lousy compared to uh, normal patients in the hospital. So they started to treat these patients with LSD and they did better. And uh, so Bill was hearing about this early 50s and he's going, you know, we're AA. I don't think we want to get involved in the drug thing. But he kept hearing more and more about success. So anyway, in August 1956, Bill Wilson tried LSD for the first time to see what it was like, and he found it was very similar to his uh, town's hospital spiritual experience, which didn't take place in town's hospital, but uh, minor incidentals of Bill's storytelling. So uh, 
yeah, so he thought he got all enthusiastic about it. But there was a second side effect is he found for periods of time after he took LSD, uh, his depression was relieved. So the official story is, oh, Bill, uh, he wasn't a drug taker. He took LSD in a lab- laboratory setting. Absolutely true the first time. Also true some of the other instances. But there was LSD use in people's houses. And, uh, uh, you know, they were kind of hipsters and, uh, you know, kind of on the leading edge. You know, it wasn't like, let's get high. It was like, let's do this into the you know, mental experimentation and stuff, but it relieved his depression. There's various accounts of when he stopped using LSD. The absolute minimum one was three years, and it's way more likely that it was closer to eight years that he used it. So uh, there was more to it than just experimentation to help other alcoholics. LSD helped Bill Wilson. So he kept taking it for quite some time until uh, the grief, uh, he was getting too much grief about the whole thing. And some of the people thought it was a good idea, thought it was a terrible idea. And then, of course, in the 60s, LSD became something else other than what it had been. It was a lab experiment in the 50s. So, you know, I'm a 60s hippie. So there was a lot of LSD when I was at University of Toronto in late 60s and early 70s. And I didn't take any. I don't know. It scared me for some reason. But uh, yeah, so that's a quick version of the LSD story. And Bob, wasn't there something else he was into? Like, was it vitamin B or something like that? Um, niacin. Niacin. Is that what it was? Yeah. So um, Ernie Kurtz, the great AA historian, uh, his Harvard University PhD thesis became Not God, which uh, uh, 41 years later is still the classic AA history. And, uh, you know, I think this new William Shaberg book goes in that category because of the phenomenal level of research, the detail. It's kind of inarguable whether you like it or not. So Ernie did that kind of research, came up with uh, his book, and he said Bill Wilson went from a passion for drinking alcohol to a passion for helping other alcoholics. And I believe that. And, uh, you know, I've written a lot of bad stuff about Bill Wilson, but uh, he's a two-sided character, and he definitely bent over backwards to help alcoholics. That's on his good side. And, um, yeah, so that's undeniable. And uh, Kurt said sometimes his judgment about that wasn't too good. Just that his... his um just his um, eagerness to help other people just went too far. Well, it could lead him to, he led him to passions like after LSD or kind of those two overlapped. uh, He thought niacin, this vitamin thing was going to be a cure. And, you know, there's somebody that didn't believe in the big book process as much as some of the fundamentalists that uh, run meetings in my neighborhood. Uh, You know, they think it solves everything. And Bill Wilson was still looking. That tells me something. Bill Wilson was still looking. They didn't, they does not have the total answer. Well, it's funny. I read in a book somewhere that um, Bill Wilson, who wrote the 12 steps, actually didn't work the 12 steps. I don't don't know if that's true or not, but um, probably hasn't worked in the way that, in the sense that, um, like, I was taught to do it when I was um, new and coming up in uh, AA in my traditional home group many years ago you mean you didn't like you don't think bill underlined in red and and uh (laughs) no i honestly think that well bob you correct me if i'm wrong but i think that when when bill if you ask bill about the steps i bet you that he wasn't thinking of them in terms of you know you're of like like all of them requiring actual physical work except for maybe the steps where you write and so forth but i think he was he wrote those steps as a description of an experience Well, anyway, Bill Wilson was a visionary, and, uh, you know, there was no 12 steps in 1934, so Ebby didn't take him through 12 steps. There's no 12 steps in Oxford group literature. There's nothing like that. There are some practices like confession, inventory sharing, uh, that sort of thing, helping others. Uh, So absolutely AA came from the Oxford group, but there was no 12 steps until Bill Wilson sat down and wrote them in 1938 in December. And he described what he did. He said, 
you know, we sat down and said, okay, we do inventory, whatever. Let me break them down a little more so there's no loopholes and uh, that slippery alcoholics like John S. and Bob K. and Angela B. can slip out of, you know, give them an excuse. So the 12 steps were Bill Wilson's best vision of moving forward. You know, here's more mythology in the book. You know, here are the steps we t- took you know, page 59 or whatever. They didn't all take those steps. If I recovered in Oxford, in uh, Akron, Ohio in 1937, by turning my life over to Jesus Christ, I didn't go and re-recover after Bill Wilson wrote the steps and do all, you know, do it his way. Uh, Apparently, uh, Ann Smith, when she heard, first heard about the 12 steps, she said, what 12 steps? <laughs> you know, so if, if there had been 12 steps, it would have been written somewhere. It would have been the letters and, uh, you know, how's your Akron people doing with the 12 steps? We got New York people going through the 12 steps. There was none of that. And, uh, you know, Bill was, uh, Bill, Bill, I see a bit, a bit like Moses, you know, uh, he led other people more than uh, he help, was able to help himself. There's back to the depression thing, you know, uh, Bill, Bill didn't do a serious inventory until he met with the uh, priest, Father Ed Dowling, in 1940, and they became buddies, and he became, uh, Dowling became Wilson's spiritual mentor, and he did exam- self-examination and stuff. I don't think Dr. Bob ever did an inventory. He went running out uh, uh, making amends, I believe that story to be true, the day after the drunken surgery, and... Uh, uh, but you know these, these guys now. Here's the here's here's where the big book contradicts itself. So here are the steps we took. The first hundred that were actually a far smaller number. Here are the steps we took, and then rarely have we seen a person fail. Well, just wait a few more months. All <laughs> kinds of them failed. You know. So if they either, you know, uh, the rarely have we seen a person fail is thoroughly followed our path. The past followers were the early guys. So here are the steps we took, which in a lot of cases they didn't take them. The Jim Burwell story, second edition of the book. Oh, once I moved to Philadelphia in 1941, yeah, I figured I'd better do a four-step inventory because I was taking newcomers uh, teaching them AA and I hadn't done it myself. So he was one of the here are the steps we took guys but they did not take the steps. They didn't all do the same thing. So they oversold the unanimity. If you think Dr. Bob and Jim Burwell, the atheist did the same thing. Uh, you know, I got a COVID virus vaccine for you. <laughs> Keep. We have a caller, Bob. Let's take this phone call and see if somebody has a question for you. Hello. How you doing? Hi, this is Gail L. Hey, Gail. From California. And I might have missed, I might have just missed you talking about it, but I had thought that originally weren't there six steps and how did it go from six steps to 12 steps and, and, um, would we've been better off with the first six, just making it simple? Why did it go 12? So why is that, Bob? Why'd they go from six to 12? Yeah. So this is an interesting one. This is. This is one of the most common stories that got messed up a bit, like telephone tag. And uh, so after AA was up and going in the 1950s, uh, they asked Bill, like, what were you doing before? What were you doing in the 30s before there was 12 steps? So he marked down six steps that they took. But those weren't, Oxford group didn't have a six step process. So that got kind of morphed into these were the Oxford group steps and they were kind of Oxford group practices, but uh, you know, Oxford group didn't have a step that said, admit your licked, you know, powerless over alcohol. They didn't have that. So that came from someplace else. Uh, And then Earl Treat, who uh, was a big Chicago uh, early guy getting Chicago going in the late thirties, uh, you know, he wrote a version that appeared in the uh, in his personal story, uh, and he also was a second edition guy, not in the first edition. And he had, you know, here's more or less what Doctor Bob had me do in 1938 or whenever it was. So 
that became that the Oxford group had six steps, but they didn't really. So the Oxford group didn't have steps, but what were the alcoholics doing when they were under the Oxford group influence? They were doing something along the lines of those steps. And then Bill Wilson expanded that when he wrote the 12 steps and, you know, steps like six and seven. And, you know, instead of doing a confession, uh, or instead of doing amends in nine, make a list of amends in eight. So, you know, a lot of steps became two, four and five were merged together, six and seven, eight and nine. Uh, You know, uh, you could even say 10 and 11 are somewhat uh, attached. So, yeah, so that's, that's some of the morphing of, but if enough people say it in enough meetings, people think the Oxford group had six, uh, tenants, and uh, if you're on Facebook, write it as tenants. T E N A N. So another boo boo for all the. Right. Ones. <laughs> but that wasn't really the case. That they it good wasn't, question though. It's a good question because no, it was just like they did certain things. You know, they they probably what they they um well they admitted they had a problem. They prayed about it. They uh, made amends. They they did those things, and I guess they just afterwards thought about it. So what what did we do? Oh, and share and sharing was big. Don't hide this stuff. You know, uh, we used to have a famous Toronto speaker when I was a newcomer uh, a long time ago, and he was one of the old guys. And he'd say, "Our secrets keep us sick." And you know, that's been said all over North America and AA by different people. But our secrets keep us sick, and. Uh, you know, I was a real secret keeper, especially at the end of my drinking, because I was ashamed of uh, a lot that was going on. And, you know, God forbid I should tell anybody, you know, it's embarrassing. And uh, instead, uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, because it's people like me, we make it very easy to confess to each other. And uh, there's an absolute psychological benefit to that stuff. Yeah. Well, if we don't have another caller, um, a a thing that that made me think of, you know, particularly shame and and stuff is um, women in AA, particularly mothers um, who admit that they have a drinking problem. You know, I'm not in that category, but um, but a lot of my friends are that that's one of the most shameful things, you know, in our society is to be a mom with an addiction. or alcoholism. And so maybe you could share a little bit about some of the women, the um, first women in AA and, and their experiences, like one or two that you can think of. Yeah. Uh, so great question again. Uh, this is, uh, I did a, like my book stemmed out of some, uh, you know, essentially history essays. I was writing on different people for uh, AA Agnostica back in the, you know, eight or seven, eight years ago. So, I wrote a, a, an essay that ended up as a chapter in the book and it was called Marty Man and the Early Women of AA. And uh, Bill Wilson kind of sold the story that Marty Mann was the first woman to get long-term sobriety and she wasn't. It was uh, Sylvia K. from Chicago, uh, sobriety date of September uh, 39. Marty Mann started coming around April 39, but she had acknowledged slips and you know, there's a lot written about Marty Mann. She went on to became become a famous uh, advocate for uh, treatment of alcoholism. This is not a moral failing. It's a, you know, it's a disease entity or, uh, you know, uh, there's physical elements of the problem. So early women of AA are interesting. They kind of were either <laughs> from the upper classes or from the lower classes. It's uh, maybe because of the shaming, middle-class women didn't come and admit they're alcoholics, but, uh, you know, some wives of executives showed up, and uh, there was a woman, uh, Jane S., who got about a year of sobriety. Uh, She was a wife of a New York stock executive, and, uh, um, yeah, then there was, like, uh, in the Dr. Bob and the good old-timers, there was like the Indian waitress and I guess she was so offensive. The wives wouldn't even let her come to the house and the meetings. And uh, so uh, as far as stigma, uh, the good news is there has probably in the history of mankind, never been less stigma against alcoholics than there is today. But that's not to say there's none. 
and there is more stigma against women than there is against men. In 2020, that's true. In 1935, that was true. And it was far worse then. At least uh, yeah. some people are coming and I get the shame of, uh, you know, mommy, uh, the wine drinking mommy. <laughs> you know, a lot of those people end up in AA and others don't. Oh, we got another caller. Um, yeah, different expectations. Let's take this yeah. call. I'm going to take this call. See who's got. Hello, how you doing? Uh, hello. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Good. Very good so far. Enjoying it. Good. Um, my name's Jay. Hey, Jay. JB. I'm from uh, Tennessee. Um, I was wondering, I had, when I was new, hey, how's it going? When I was new, I had a lot of trouble with sponsors, and, and things like people vary on how much importance they put on that. In the book, it just sounds like, you know, someone to guide you through the steps, but it seems somehow it's more into someone who, you know, some people have sponsors that tell them everything to do in their lives. I was wondering if that just sometime during AA's involvement that uh, that role of sponsors changed. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for calling. So, Bob, what about sponsorship and how has yeah, it changed over the years? Yeah, I'm going to talk about this a bit. It's a little outside my ex, uh, area of expertise, but here's um, the interesting thing about AA. When there was AA in three cities, every city operated differently. So there was no McDonald's franchising and have the brown rug and whatever. Uh, they all operated differently. And uh, um, uh, so the sponsorship, you know, there's no pattern of that. Uh, the book was written to replace sponsors. The, yeah. And, you know, sponsors don't like that. I'm on big book dumpers. I go there to get material to write uh, essays and, uh, yeah, I, I get a kick out of making one guy, the head guy there, I make his brain explode about once a month. It's just kind of fun. I have that nasty side to me. I'm not as nice as you think. So uh, uh, some sponsors, and, and let's face it, alcoholics have got low self-esteem. You know, when I become a sponsor and start pushing somebody around, you see that guy's self-esteem go way up, you know? So the other thing that uh, thumpers do by looking down at, 12 and 12ers or agnostics or meeting makers. Um, an old way to get self-esteem is, uh, yeah, you know, I'm a drunk, but I'm not as bad as that guy. And I go up a few notches by putting somebody down. In AA, we do it in groups. And AA has a lot of subgroups. And if I'm with the cool subgroup, whatever it is, and I look down and we're smarter than the other people are doing it better or whatever, but uh, sponsors could get carried away. That's a common thing. Uh, uh, I've seen people tell people what to eat for breakfast and uh, it's really way beyond what the thing is intended uh, to be. Yeah. Wasn't the original sponsorship um, to like actually get into a meeting? So I, was it yeah, in so, and, yeah, and all so. that stuff happened with the baseball player and you did not look it up on the internet to find out where the ne nearest meeting to my house was. And, uh, you know, right. uh, uh, a lot of people were approached in hospitals. So, uh, Dr. Bob, of course, was a physician. He had, uh, access to a couple of hospitals. And then once his reputation got uh, resuscitated, other doctors would say, Hey, I got a guy over here that, uh, could use what you guys are selling. Why don't you come over and talk to him? And, uh, they talk to people that start now as going to a meeting and in the, uh, in another era, well, you got interviewed before you went to meetings and, uh, you're in the hospital for the five day detox and AA members would come and talk to you. And if they didn't think you were serious enough, they wouldn't take you. So Angela, before we started mentioned Jim Burwell, Jim Burwell never would have got sober in Ohio. It, they would have tossed them. They wouldn't have tolerated them. And, uh, you know, Jim Burwell ended up sober 36 years when he died. The most famous atheist agnostic uh, did a lot to pave the doorway, uh, door for the route for people like me to survive an AA with the s small changes they were able to get. Why wouldn't he have made it in Ohio? Because Dr. Bob was God, God, God. He had a nun 
telling him to calm down on the God talk. <laughs> a nun. Just tell him I can't lay, ease up a bit, Bob. You know, and like he would he wasn't a Bob, he wasn't a God as you understand him guy. No. You know, Clarence Snyder, the famous Cleveland founder, he's talking about his first uh, you know, beautiful biography by his sponsee Mitchell K. Uh, how it worked. Brilliant book. And uh, so there's Clarence telling us how it was from 1938 on. And he got Jesus bombed at his first couple of meetings and guys hand him brochures and, uh, you know, uh, Jesus, he stuff and let's kneel down and pray together. And, uh, and uh, Jim Burwell, he would have reacted to that and they would have said, fine, get out. Yeah. No, yeah, not, yeah. Not as inclusive as the theory. Right. <laughs> you know, when Angela was asking about um, women uh, in AA, um, I got an email today that I think you would find interesting, Bob, because it was written by somebody um, who was inspired by an article that you wrote on AA Beyond Belief. And it happens to be um, the grandson of uh, Florence Rankin. And he writes that I am a grandson of Florence Rankin, who was questionably the first female member of AA and had her story, A Feminine Victory, published in the first edition in the big book. I have been clean and sober and an AA member for 33 years. Sobriety date is 4-30-87. I'm 71 years old and never met Florence, but have a limited bit of history passed from my mom to me of her. Flo was her nickname, and she died in 1943, five years before my birth. I read Bob Kay's March 17th, 2019 article in AA Beyond Belief that was forwarded to me by a friend. Though I'm not religious, I feel a connection to Florence. I also encourage my non-drinking wife at 30 years old to drink and drug. That wasn't nice. <laughs> and she too became an alcoholic, got sober in AA, and so far stayed sober for 25 years. If there were a guardian angel or whatever, I would have to say that Flo was looking out for me and was instrumental through the program in getting me cleaned up. How about that? Yeah, that's good. Uh, uh, Florence was probably the second woman in AA to get a reasonable amount of sobriety, like a year. And uh, uh, she had a couple of relapses. And then when the book was printed, she had a year, close to a year. So a feminine victory. And the sad thing is the victory didn't last very long. Uh, she was probably drinking again while the ink was drying on the big books, you know, as early as April 39 and she had moved down to Washington. And so a smaller support group there. And, uh, um, you know, she got a, uh, she got, she got a boyfriend of a newcomer. Like, you know, we're still, I mean, it's old school advice. Don't get new, any new relationships your first year. But yeah, so she, she hooked up with a newcomer. He got drunk and she got drunk. But what, what I could tell, and I don't know, you know, when you go research somebody like Florence, there was no biography to go read and shorten it down to uh, uh, an essay like I could do with Marty Mann. There's, you know, 400 page book on Marty Mann. So Florence, we're working a lot with her story. And then there's a little bit in Pass It On, the AA conference approved literature, the kind we're allowed to read, Angela. <laughs> Burn those other books. And uh, so uh, from her story, uh, her big book story is evident to me and from a little of the other Pass It On history, she seemed pretty neurotic. And, uh, you know, most of us arrive here with some sort of issues besides drinking, issues that maybe propel us to drinking in a self-medicating manner like you know, and neur neurotic is one of them. I, I think, you know, I don't know what percentage of AA members are diagnosably neurotic, but it's higher than the regular population. And the rest of us, we have that. And it might not be at a diagnosable level, but uh, we're nervous. I, 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 I was a toe tapper under the table 60 years ago at the kitchen table. And my father, stop, stop flipping your knee. And I, I was some version of ADHD or whatever. Uh, Bob, we have another call. Let's LDS for Angela. So. <laughs> Hello, You're how you doing? You're going to tell us out and go to church, John. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Hi. Uh, this is Hillary from New York. 
Hillary. Bob, can you talk uh, a little bit about Tom Powers Sr. and the writing of the 12th and 12th and uh, Wilson's part in that? Yeah, um, and I know Hillary. I spoke at her New York meeting. Hillary is an interesting woman. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we had a, a we had a, a, I'm on Facebook a lot and I know Hillary from Facebook from about eight or nine years. Anyway, we, there was a psychotherapist, uh, called jail was in one of these groups and, uh, she was kind of a, a youngian. So she was an expert in Carl Jung. And she said one day, uh, Jung was an eccentric genius. So an eccentric genius. And he was eccentric and Hillary's a bit of an eccentric genius so the same thing but uh so bill's writing the 12 and 12 uh he's been stomping around the country trying to sell the traditions he's convinced they're important and he's getting eh, yeah you're getting a mediocre reaction so he figures well we'll jazz up the book with some uh people are interested in the steps and we'll write some more philosophical stuff about the background but anyway, he's in a depression. And so when they wrote the big book, they had sort of writing sessions. And this is in Shaberg's book in some detail. So they'd have barnstorming sessions, Hank, Bill, and Ruth. Uh, Bill would be the principal writer, but, you know, they'd make suggestions. They'd toss it out. He'd go home, write some stuff. They'd tear it all apart the next day. So the 12 and 12 got written like that. This is not common information, but... Uh, people will hear that Tom P. Sr. was an editor of the 12 and 12. Well, I think, and I can't prove it, but he was much more than an editor. I think he wrote large chunks of it. The 12 and 12 is a very inconsistent book. Between 1939 and the early 50s, Bill Wilson had liberalized a lot. We read that in letters. And the 12 and 12, there's some religious ranting in there that is worse than uh, what we see in the big book to the secularist uh, ear and to the you know, non-traditionalist ear. And uh, so I think Tom Powers wrote big parts of the uh, 12 and 12. There was another woman involved called Betty Love. And uh, so... The 12 and 12 is like a book that was written by committee. There's some brilliant stuff in there and there's some terrible, you know, there's anti, there's, you know, uh, seven deadly sins. And, uh, you know, that's more than uh, religious stuff than in the big book. And then in other places, it's depressing. You know, if you read that in a kind of monotone voice, you go, oh, Jesus, I'm going to shoot myself. So I believe Tom Powers wrote a lot of it. Tom Powers was, he was a reformed drinker. He was a reformed womanizer. He was all over Bill to start stop messing around with other women. And Bill said, uh, yeah, well, good idea, but I can't. And uh, so uh, Powers eventually left AA and formed uh, All Addictions Anonymous. Uh, but I think he wrote a big part of the 12 and 12, and that is totally unprovable. But uh the, the kind of logic of it comes together. That's interesting. I never heard that before, that there was someone awesome. else. Thanks, BK. Thank you, Hillary. Yeah, thank you for calling, Hillary. I appreciate that. Well, that was nice. It's fun to get these callers. You know, we've had about like over 35 people in the chat room all night long. You're very popular, Bob. In fact, you have a friend out there from Brighton, England, who says hello to you. Oh, yeah, he's a coolest. <laughs> How about that? So um, I was going to ask you when you said that um, going kind of going back to the beginning, but you, you said that Bill's white light experience wasn't in town's hospital. Where was it? Okay. So uh, it, towards the end of November, there's a famous uh, Ebby visit described earlier in the story. That's uh, best described as late November. And uh, so that's when he had the white light experience. It's, it's right there in his own, you know, there's uh, it's, a, it's like a handwritten uh, second version of Bill's story. And there it is. So the, you know, the cool wind and all that stuff, uh, it happens in his house two weeks before he quits drinking. 
So on December 7th, he meanders down to the Calvary uh, uh, mission. Uh, Ebby had said, come on down and check it out. Uh, that's where Ebby was living at the time. And, you know, they'd have the religious services and free food and uh, uh, flop for the kind of homeless, no money guys. And uh, so, yeah, he went down there and made an altar call. And, uh, you know, it doesn't say so in the conference approved literature, but I'm pretty sure he probably said a few kind words about Jesus Christ and uh, still didn't stop drinking. Went home. By the time he got home, he was pretty sober. Talked to Lois, told her all about it. It was all enthusiastic. She got enthusiastic. The next day he got up, as some of us do, and took a couple of shots to take the edge off. And Lois found him passed out when she got home from work. So it was a few more days till he went to Towns Hospital. But the, the, the spiritual experience taking place in Towns Hospital fits better. You know, he doesn't keep drinking, so it's miraculous, never drank again. So suits that element of the story. And then besides that, he has Ebby going through the process with him, such as it was at the time. Oh, okay. So it just, make, it just makes a better story. Oh, and uh, fits the narrative of what they're selling. Take these steps and this will happen, not take these steps and you'll only drink for two more weeks. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know in that book um that shopper wrote what didn't um hank parkhurst play like a huge role in putting the big book together so here's the thing that's understandable so i'm a big player in getting aa's book done a book about quitting drinking for alcoholics and i go back to drinking you know, uh, I'm not going to be around when the history gets written about me. So, so Hank essentially got written out. His role got minimized as one of the main points of Sheberg's book. And somebody like me is, is, you know, I'm not totally humble about this. I've read like 40 or 50 books and internet stuff. And I, like, I know a lot about AA history. And when I read Sheberg's book, I just kept learning stuff I didn't know. I didn't know how huge Hank's role was. Hank did editing. All we say in AA, oh, Hank's a terrible writer. Look at his story. Uh, he, you know, he was almost illiterate. Hank did tons of editing of uh, the personal stories and stuff. Wow. we got another caller. Let's see who this is. This is fun. It's like, ask Stump the Expert. Hello, how you doing? Hi, you. Who's this? Doing good. Hello? Hi. Yeah, this is Kevin Ma from Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, hey, Kevin. How you doing? Thanks for calling. Good. Thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. So, um, yeah, I read uh, Ernie's book, uh, Not God. It was pretty enlightening. Um, but aside from that, I'm... Uh, I've been sold in AA since 1986, and uh, I was introduced to the program in 1976. But um, I read the big book an awful lot, and um, I researched, you know, different aspects of uh, the book. But you know, a lot of it um, is very, very helpful, and. Uh, there's certain sections of it that I um, am very suspect of, and uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of big book steps groups, but I'm sort of going through that process right now, and, you know, these these people seem to live and breathe every single word that's in the book, and I try to explain to them that it just doesn't add up in a lot of areas, and one of the examples I try to show them is in the... Um, carpet slipper who retired at 55 after 25 years of sobriety and out come the slippers and, <laughs> right. and I said just just try to do the math on this <laughs> one guy just try to do the math on this guy I mean he's at this age and then it would be back in the early the late 1800s and they're you know up to this point and and I'm like this 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 is like they call a parable of progression. This is not an actual story, and they get mad at me. But 
just want to know what 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 your you guys thoughts are on those um, aspects of um, uh, the um, alcoholism and and how they try to point things out. But to my mind, it seems as though that that guy with the carpet slippers is more of a parable than an actual story. So if you do the math, it's it's crazy. So anyway. Um, a lot of good stuff going on in the, on the podcast. Oh, and, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this whole thing. It's my wife just found this. She says, you may like to do the history, so uh-huh. I'm into it. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for calling, and thank you for listening. I love doing these live streams on Friday. This is just so much fun, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun to watch the audience grow, too. 43 people in there. I keep counting. So, Bob, what do you think about that? Are those... Uh, are those parables in the big book uh, or are they this is a good one? I just want to say quickly, uh, you know, I am no orange papers guy. Uh, I've been sober uh, for almost, you know, 28 and a half years. Uh, and I got sober in conventional AA. There were no agnostic meetings and I worked around it and I'm a believer. I call the big book a mixture of the weird and wonderful and that's kind of what the caller was getting at. So, you know, Sober Since 86 has some appreciation of it. I think there's a lot of uh, good psychology underneath the religious language. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, my late father will be 59 years sober in 11 days. So, you know, it's around a long time. And uh, here's where some of the... You know, uh, here's where uh, he helped me a bit with some of the mythology. In 1991, I asked him, I was at this hardcore meeting, like something like like what the caller's describing. And, you know, they made it sound like, boy, we just newcomers in the old days. We just smacked them down with a two by four, they used to say. Sat them down, told them, you know, and of course, here we're back to the self-esteem thing, you know these people seeing themselves as tellers of the truth. So this mythology of the old days gets built up. So my father got sober in 61. His sponsor lived across the street, got sober in 51. So I said, was AA different in the old days? And he said a line that I will repeat over and over again till the day I die. He said, there are preachers now and there were preachers then. And he says, my sponsor, Harry H., never raised his voice to me. So, you know, all the tough talk. Uh, yeah, some people did that and they're still doing it. And other people talk to people like they're civilized human beings. So Dr. Bob did not get talked to and whacked with a two by four in the icon- iconic meeting in Henrietta Cyberlink's house. Uh, just quickly on the, and great one to bring up the carpet slippers guy. So there's a theory. There was, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'm big on uh, the big book being influenced by Richard Peabody's book, The Common Sense of Drinking, published in 1931. There's chunks of that that are taken out almost without uh, modification and just plunked into the big book. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Uh, we have found that halfway measures are of no avail. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Didn't change that much. So in Peabody's book, there was apparently uh, uh, somebody who came within the realm of Peabody who worked as a lay therapist helping people with alcoholism problem. And there was a guy, and this was a story in Peabody's book, and uh, he had stayed sober for about five or six years, uh, you know, uh, uh, focused on business, distracted himself, then retired, uh, got out to carpet slippers, went to Florida and went back to drinking. Well, Bill Wilson, well, if the guy stays sober five years, let's make it 25. <laughs> you know, it'll be a better story. And Bill Wilson jab, jab, jazzed up stories. And, you know, uh, was he a liar? Well, kind of, but he was more of an exaggerator. And like I, I've known in bars, storytellers and I love it and you know they're jazzing up the story because it's better than it was last year right and that was kind of the tradition he came from too uh, from his upbringing like you said Uh, he came from a storyteller tradition so that's just the way way he was 
and the way way that book is written. What I what you what I was thinking about when you uh, were asking about the big book was um, the contradictions in it. Uh, I I come from a, a background where um, the group that I my home group for many years was one of those that you know um, latched onto every single word of the big book and you know just thought it was just the the book the only book you needed and. Uh, we divinely kinda, inspired yeah and we just kind of overlooked some of the inconsistencies and contradictions but they're certainly in there you know it's kind of funny yeah oh yeah but um i think that that by the way thanks for reminding me yeah that it's friday i forgot i'm, <laughs> I'm in lockdown so i know when you said friday i'm like is it friday today's friday i know isn't that weird it's like one day but is yeah. like every other day <laughs> <laughs> Just to emphasize, at the time of the writing, if this guy was 55, 25 years sober, you got to go back 25 years and he's so old, you know, it's like, uh, come on, you know, this is too obvious, you know? Yeah. That's just one example. Yeah. No. That, yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys just taking the time. Well, thank you for calling. I appreciate it. That was nice of you. And we're up on an hour. I'll be back next Friday. Hey, cool. Thank you. So we're up on an hour. Uh, Bob, is there anything we should cover that, that, that you would like to cover that we haven't talked about? Just, uh, um, yeah, I guess I'll do some pimping. Uh, I've written two new books. Uh, we haven't gone to technical yet. I've spent all winter just uh, editing and proofreading. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I can get pretty picky on that stuff. And, you know, I go, here's the final proofreading for the third time. Then I change two things. So I say, well, you better go over it again. And then when this COVID thing hit, uh, I haven't felt like my concentration hasn't been up to par, but, uh, and then I felt like recreation, you know, rather than work. And <laughs> so, uh, you know, book stuff like that is work. And, um, but I've written a biographical fiction, uh, probably about 400 pages, on Bill Wilson, where I follow the history very closely. But like, as in biographical fiction, there's conversation. I have conversations between him and Hank, and uh, you know, uh, he's definitely a womanizer in my book. I don't get the details of that. I just have a t him tossing it out there, like. Uh, and the famous motorcycle trip, he only drank a few times. It was when he was exploring the companies and he worked on a farm for a while. And I said, you know, we, then we went down south and I got in a little trouble uh, with drinking in Florida and Havana. And in Havana, there was a woman involved, but I was able to calm Lois down, tell her how drunk I was. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, didn't do 50 shades of bill, but uh, yeah, pretty interesting uh, book, I think. What I like, uh, you know, there's 10 biographies of Bill. I've never seen a historical fiction, so this will be a first of, and uh, I hope it will make some money because I'm not uh, making any money fixing golf slices these days. <laughs> right. It sounds like an interesting book. I look forward to it coming out. I yeah, mean, the other one is just a prehistory. There's a lot of prehistory in my book that's the key players in AA history. And I just went into things like uh, uh, Lois's family religion, Swedenborgianism. Uh, anyway, incredible similarities to some of AA's letting go of self. And once you get into these quirky Christian spiritual stuff, I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot of overlap, new thought and whatever. So, but uh is we don't hear much that a bill or that Lois's family, Lois's family was very religious and uh, Bill was a big fan of her family because, you know, he's at home with the uh, old people my age when he's a 10 year old kid. So here he is a teenager going, hanging out at Lois's place where they had interesting intellectual conversations and they sat around the dinner table for three hours and said more than just pass the salt. That's what he was getting at home with the grandparents. Well, it was nice, Bob, having you here. And Angela, once again, it's always fun to talk talk with you. And thank you for being spending another Friday with with me here. Um, just this is this is really a, a nice time for me. I, I always look forward to Fridays, and it's amazing to me how quickly they they get here. And uh, thank all of you that have been listening uh, to these podcasts and are watching these live streams on YouTube and, you know, 
making these comments in the chat room and chatting with each other and the occasional troll that comes by. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I, do enjoy. I did throw that one guy out that we, there was somebody <laughs> there trolling us today, Bob. He wasn't saying some nice things about you. And I said, I, I let him go with it for a little while, but I thought, okay, he is a troll. We do have to, we do have to yeah. do something. Oh man. I thought, I thought he was removed by the power of Gail. Dang it. <laughs> Well, yeah. what I did, I was watching him go on. He was going on really criticizing Bob's book, and it was kind of rude. To, I mean, to yeah, to, yeah. to no, do that while Bob's here talking. You know? so, yeah. Anyway. anyway, thanks to both of you, and thanks to the people who phoned in. There were some pretty good questions. So. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. So here we go. That's it. That's another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast, and another Friday staying. What is it called? Sober distancing. That's right. Sober distancing. <laughs> Sober distancing. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll be back again real soon. And again, I really appreciate this opportunity uh, and spending this time with you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>